Welcome to our Sunday uh, worship service. At this time, please silence your devices. And uh, we will now begin by playing This Is My Father's World. Thank you, Bob. Will you please uh, give our welcome and opening and uh, call to worship, please? I'll be glad to. On this Father's Day, we're really celebrating the, the growth and the relationship of families and how dads have been so instrumental with moms in raising children, Lord. And I just want to bless and have the Lord bless everyone that is a dad or is planning to be a dad or is in the in, in becoming a dad as we speak. So Father, we just thank you for this amazing day, for the love and the grace that has brought us all together. And 
We're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic, and that opens up our hearts to more hope and, and faith in that we'll get through this together. So, Father, I just ask you to be with Pastor Randy today and be with all of us here. And, and thank you, Dan and, and Jen, for the beautiful music that you've played and just the opportunity that we have on this day to celebrate our fathers, Lord. And uh, many of our fathers are gone already, but, but they were instrumental in bringing us to where we are today. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for your amazing grace, your love, your healing, and your forgiveness, and the support that you have given all of us and our families throughout all this thing. So, Father, we put our lives and our relationships and our world in your hands and ask for help and guidance and protection. And we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Lily and I would now like to lead you in singing Create in Me a Clean Heart. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's time for our community prayer. Uh, please follow the slides. I will read the part for one, and you can follow with me and read the part for all. And uh, we will also have a prayer for our fathers. Um, and so again, so join me for that as well. The word of God. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these, um, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not careless about the requirements of the law. He wants us to be attentive and careful and asks us to bring all aspects of our lives before God. I pray that I might respect the voice of my conscience as I try to hear how God is speaking to me. I am often told the winners told the winners and losers are. I hear about the great and I am taught to ignore the small. Jesus showed me a different way of thinking about who is great in his sight. 
I think of the people I admire and I ask Jesus to show me who really deserves my attention. Heavenly Father, I confess that I am a guilty sinner and deserving of punishment for my sin. Thank you for in your grace you gave the Lord Jesus to live sinless life and take punishment for my sins. Thank you that through his life and death I have been removed from the curse of the law and set free from your righteous condemnation because Jesus took punishment for all my sin and in my place. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We also give thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. Fatherhood does not come with a manual, and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for all of them and forgiveness where it is needed. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices fathers make for their children and families and the ways, both big and small, that they lift children to achieve dreams thought beyond reach. So too, we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass early or are absent, grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our families. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give them the strength to do well by their children and by you. In your holy name, O God, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Vessi. For our next song, Lily and I are going to lead you in singing, You're Worthy of My Praise. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches and teaches these commandments, these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys on this um, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Um, we are continuing our series in the uh, Sermon in the Mount. And uh, this week, I have been assigned to preach on the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And, um, you know, I thought beginning with this particular uh, teaching, uh, maybe uh, just an overview of what the Old Testament law actually comprise, comprises of, uh, I thought it might be uh, insightful. Um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. I said real quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, here's a here's an overview of um, what Jesus, when he says the law, it could be referring to. So when it comes to the Old Testament law, Jesus is uh, referring to probably the five books of the Old Testament, right? Also known as the Pentateuch, also known as the Torah. And, uh, you know, specifically the content of the law is spread among the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, the Ten Commandments is a part of this Old Testament law. Uh, moral laws like murder, theft, honesty, adultery, etc. Social laws were also probably pertinent on property, inheritance, marriage, and divorce. Food laws on what is clean, unclean. We're all familiar with passages about clean and unclean on cooking and storing food. Purity laws on menstruation, seminal omissions, skin disease, and mildew, etc. Right. The laws regarding gatherings, feasts, the Day of Atonement, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, sacrifices and offerings, the sin offering, burnt offering, whole offering, heave offering. Passover sacrifice, meal offering, wave offering, peace offering, drink offering, thank offering, dough offering, incense, incense offering, red heifer, scapegoat, first fruits. And then there's also instructions for the priest and high priest, high priest, including tithes. And then lastly, instructions regarding the tabernacle and which were later applied to the temple in Jerusalem including these concerning of holies and holies containing to the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and there's also uh, in, uh, instructions on construction of various altars, right? Uh, let me stop sharing. I'm back. So you guys get, the, get, get a comprehensive view of possibly what Jesus is talking about uh, when it comes to the Old Testament law. It's a lot. <laughs> There'll be a test next week. All right, a quiz. Um, so verse 17 in to 20, it's commentators uh, suggest that it's actually uh, intro verses to a wider section that goes from verse 17 all the way to verse 48. So um, you're supposed to read 17 to 20 in light of all the way to verse 48 of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, so they're not isolated passages, but they're supposed to be read in its totality. Uh, but my colleagues, they're going to expound on 
uh, the rest of the verses uh, throughout throughout the series. Um, but Jesus says, you know, that in 17 to tw uh, 20, he is the fulfillment of the law. And again, it's a uh, general statement. And then he goes into detail. He provides about six examples after verse 20 about uh, how Jesus fulfilling of the law contrasts superficial uh, kind of reading and superficial application of certain Old Testament laws, such as divorce, right? Um, so in verses 17 to 20, Jesus says, uh, I have come to fulfill the law, the Old Testament law, and he also encompasses prophecy, right? I've come to fulfill the law and prophecy. And to fulfill is basically to bring about what scripture stated. And that is what Jesus has done now. Uh, but Jesus is very specific in our passage today. He says that, hey, I have come to fulfill the Old Testament law and uh, all the prophecy. However, right? However, it does not mean the elimination of the law. The law remains, according to Jesus, wholly authoritative and demands full respect of his disciples, right? Wholly authoritative and demands full respect of his disciples. So I think a logical follow-up question is how, right? How, how do we actually, did, I mean, you guys, you guys saw those laws, right? That's <laughs> a lot. It's very extensive. How, how does the law actually function for the disciples in, in the midst of or after uh, Jesus fulfills them, right? Verse 20 indicates what? Verse 20 of our passage indicates that um, the meticulous legal, like legalism of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law was not how you do it. The, the meticulous, legalistic fulfill, uh, a following of the law by the Pharisees and teachers of the law, inadequate, right? Inadequate according to Jesus in the context of the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus is saying is that that's not how you do it. We, what I'm requiring, it's a higher calling. A higher approach is needed. And uh, that's what verses 21 through 47 uh, that we'll be, we'll be delving into more in the coming weeks, a higher approach, right? Jesus is actually saying, what I'm, what I'm requiring of you surpasses, surpasses the meticulous legalistic following of the Pharisees, right? It surpasses that ethic. So for us to be even more strict, more literal in our observance is probably not is probably not the right direction to go into, right? Rather for us to explore, 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 seek understanding in uh, what is is a daunting daunting task, but what is the true will the true will of God in the intended law? And that's what we're going to spend the remainder of our time talking about. The true will of God, right? The true will of God and what the true will of God in the midst of the Old Testament fulfillment, right? And the new covenant, what the true will of God is for us. Because we are what? Gentiles. We are not Jews, right? Unless we have Jewish church members. Hello, how are you? <laughs> we're Gentiles, right? Two views, like these are historic and theological um, uh, teachings, traditions regarding uh, how Gentiles should view um, Old Testament law in light of the New Covenant. Um, so two views of Old Testament law in light of the New Covenant. Um, you guys, some of you guys have probably already heard of these, but uh, the first is supersessionism, also known as replacement theology. 
And this theological uh, teaching and tradition asserts that the new covenant through Jesus Christ supersedes the old covenant, which was made exclusively with the Jewish people. So what supersessionism and replacement theology teaches is that it's, it's uh, uh, not relevant anymore, right? The Old Testament law, the new, te te new covenant, right, is what's pertinent to us. The Old Testament is, Old Testament law is actually, uh, yeah, is actually irrelevant for us, right? That's replacement theology. And there's another thought, dual covenant theology, or also known as two covenant theology. And this asserts that the old, it's very, it's kind of similar, but it says that the old covenant or the law of Moses re remains valid, law of Moses, remains valid for the Jews while the new covenant only applies to non-Jews or Gentiles. But then there's this little caveat that the moral law still holds for new covenant people, right? So dual covenant theology, two, two covenant, also known as two covenant theology says that old covenant or the law of Moses remains valid for Jews while new covenant people, it, it, uh, it does not apply to us, right? Only the new covenant applies to us but there's this little caveat that the moral law still holds, right? Catholic, reformed churches, Methodist churches usually, uh, usually hold to the dual, co dual covenant theology. So if historic and contemporary theology suggests that for us Gentiles, we are off the hook, <laughs> right? We are off the hook in regards to the Old Testament law in light of the new covenant how should we, right? How do we reconcile this as Gentiles in the new covenant? How do we view the Old Testament law? And how do we exercise this freedom, right? As, a, as recipients of the new covenant. So I started thinking like, hey, maybe it's just uh, isolated to Matthew. Because if you guys didn't know, uh, the gospel of Matthew is, what's the intended audience for the gospel of Matthew? The intended audience is Jewish audience. It's a Jewish audience. Jesus was, was addressing primarily Jews, right? In this specific passage. So what do other, other gospels outside of Matthew say about the Old Testament law in light of the new covenant? Uh, I came across Luke, Luke 16, verse 16, chapter 16, verse 16. And Luke was what? A Gentile, right? Luke came from a, a Greek Hellenistic worldview. He was a Gentile. And this is what Luke says. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone who is forcing their way into it. Verse 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Right? Luke 2. Luke, Luke and Matthew are in sync. Luke is saying, hey, uh, the law and prophets, it was preached up until John the Baptist, right? You are a new covenant people, but guess what? Old, covenant, Old Testament law is still, it's still relevant for us, right? It's still a significant factor. Verse 17, I'm going to read again. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law, right? So we are not off the hook, <laughs> according to the Gospels, right? Matthew and Luke both state that the Old Testament law still matters. It's still a factor, a significant factor, I might add, in our theological reconciliation, right? Of trying to figure out, in our seeking of God's will, we cannot just push aside the Old Testament law, according to the Gospels. How do we reconcile these verses again with our own spiritual laws, uh, spiritual lives as New Covenant Gentile Christians? Um, in my kind of processing and, and, and just try to um, find my own personal clarity about how to reconcile this, I came across a word study that could potentially provide a little bit of clarity, right? Um, in this possible confusion. And I was, I was focused on what is the goal? What is the goal of this passage? And I think the goal is clearly stated in verse 20, right? In verse 20, the, the, the call of Jesus is for his disciples and eventually uh, wider Gentiles to be what? 
righteous, right? The goal is righteousness. Um, and, you know, as I was looking a little bit deeper into that word righteousness, what does it actually mean? In the original Greek, righteousness means equity of character. Equity of character or equity of act. So could Jesus be suggesting that we are called to be more equal, more fair, more just than the Pharisees? Is that the, could, could that be the potential will of God? Richard Rohr, a Catholic priest and renowned spiritual author, describes the new covenant reality. He describes it as a Christ-soaked world, a Christ-soaked world, in which he further elaborates and describes a Christ-soaked world as inherent dignity for all. Inherent dignity for all. So when I couple Richard Rohr's uh, uh, kind of perspective, and then that word study of righteousness actually meaning equity, equity in character, equity in act, and Richard War's dignity for all, it helps me, and hopefully a little beneficial for you, but it helps me kind of uh, reconcile and kind of have a clearer understanding of what potential, what God's potential uh, will could be. Do we recall what, what was Jesus's major issue with the Pharisees? What did it involve? Jesus was, was so frustrated with the Pharisees. Although the Pharisees were very braggadocious about keeping the law, the Pharisees actually used the law to what? Create and maintain hierarchies, divisions, right? Keith, Keith uh, talked about that in his sermon. The Pharisees thrived in a system that was delineated us versus them, holy versus unholy, acceptable versus unacceptable, in and out, right? They thrived on this hierarchy. They thrived on these divisions. Further in, their, in the Pharisees' constant judgment, categorizing and dividing of people who were pushed out who in, in the Pharisees uh, power dynamics, who were consistently pushed out further and further into the margins, the vulnerable, right? the marginalized. Uh, in other words, injustice, and there was not dignity for all. So if literally keeping the law is not effective, like the meticulous keeping of the law is not effective in pleasing God, and in light of the extensive nature of the Old Testament law and the impossibility, it's impossible for anyone to maintain it apart from Jesus, could it be, could it be that the Old Testament law was built for us to fail? Again, it was built for us, it was developed, maintained for us to fail. We are all meant to fail. <laughs> we are all meant to fall short. Could it be that the purpose of the Old Testament law is not to condemn us, rather to free us from trying to be God? We are all meant to Fall short, a la Romans 3.23. Richard Rohr suggests that in our spiritual life, and I think he would even expand in our lives in general, in our spiritual life, we have to fail. We have to fail. We have to fail. Failure keeps us humble. Right? Failure keeps us humble. In this context, then Matthew 5 and Luke 16 explicitly say that the Old Testament law will remain intact. It makes more sense to me. Okay. Jesus is the only one who fulfills the law, not the Pharisees, not you, definitely not me. <laughs> but again, the spirit of the Old Testament law will remain intact. It will remain intact 
individually and it will remain intact within our communities as a consistent reminder that we are not, we are not God. What a freeing, refreshing and humbling reminder. In closing, Richard Rohr suggests that when we maintain as individuals and as a community, when we maintain a deep reverence, a deep reverence for the Old Testament law within our community, a new covenant community, he says, it's not about being judgmental. Rather, it's about being what? Watchful. It's not about being judgmental, but it's, be, but it's, it's rather it's about being watchful. Because although we are new covenant people enjoying grace, we all have the potentiality for sin to derail us, right? For sin to create hierarchies and divisions and separation and push the vulnerable further out into the margins. I wanna read that quote again, because I think it's very, very insightful. Again, when we have a deep, reverence for the Old Testament law within a new covenant grace-filled community. It's not about being judgmental, rather watchful, right? rather watchful. Again, I really appreciate his insight here. I think there is a tone, there's a feel, there's an experiential difference from being a judgmental community and being a watchful community. Judgment suggests what? In, out us, them. Watchfulness, watchfulness suggests what? We. We are all in this together. We all have the potentiality for sin. We all have the potentiality to fall astray, right? Let's watch each other's back. Make sure we do not fall too far astray in light of the Old Testament law, but being new covenant grace-filled community. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for uh, the paradoxical reality of life that two things that seem so opposite can be true and can be relevant at the same time. When we read parts of the Old Testament law, it seems so contrary to the new covenant grace. But I pray, Holy Spirit, you use this teaching to really help us reconcile and appreciate the fact that no, 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 these, these contrary, contrary concepts do not conflict, but they actually complement one another. Through the Old Testament law, create in us a deep reverence for your holiness and a gracious, gentle, compassionate reminder that we are not God, that we are not the ones that you have bestowed with the authority to create hierarchies and divisions and separation within our communities. Rather, we are all free, free from playing God. And we just watch each other's back. We simply watch, watch out for one another and make sure we do not let our sinful natures uh, fall us astray. Thank you so much, Father God, for this reminder, for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for the message, Pastor Randy. Let us remember what we are taught today. Keep us be the watchful community so that we can be pleasing before God. From now on, let us praise together. The song we'll be singing is The Goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been hand in your hands. From the moment that I wake up in my hands, 
I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, my dad, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have never let me die. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I will be in the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen.